Hello, everyone. Welcome to Love and Philosophy Beyond Dichotomies. Today, we're talking to C.T. Nguyen, mostly about his book, Games, Agency as Art, but also about many other things. Of course, about love. How is it related to games? T is a kind of philosopher's philosopher, so it's a little surprising to hear him say that philosophy was his backup career, that he actually wanted to be a novelist. But when you hear how much pleasure he takes in Kant's formula of humanity, I think, like me, you will also imagine he's always been a philosopher as well. And he is a very good writer. And that, that can sometimes be uh, trouble in the <laughs> philosophical world. Sometimes it's a little suspect. Uh, a lot of people we think of as writers like Nietzsche or Camus or Hannah Arendt, who herself said she's not a philosopher, sort of um, as a way of addressing this exact uh, issue, uh, are not really considered real philosophers in some very particular analytic circles. But of course, in other circles, they are. So it really just matters where you're coming from. But still, it, it's an interesting little puzzle that we do turn back and forth and shift around like a Rubik's Cube. Art, porn, focus, vulnerability. We talk a lot about trust, as that's another topic that T writes about a lot. And we do talk about these boundaries of the academic and artistic voice. Um, are games and art about the attitude one brings to them or the object itself? Does being an agent mean we have an experience of agency? How gamified have our lives become? How aware are we of the stakes of that agency that's being set for us, either by game makers or coders, or what is a game, really, and how is it different from play? Uh, T helps me understand that a bit. Rather offhandedly, he gives me maybe one of the best definitions I've ever heard, a casual sort of definition about what a philosopher is really doing. We are talking about neutrality and he says something about how in his own life, this, the richness that he's gotten from philosophers is not from thinking of philosophers as some standpoint, free, neutral observer, but rather it's been understanding philosophers as people questioning. And I think he says thinking and talking out of themselves. I really like this phrase, out of themselves, because it can mean, you know, from within, from one's own path and trajectory and experience. And it can also mean sort of moving beyond that into different agental, agent bases or perspectives, which is all stuff I'm really interested in in my own research. And T gives, sheds a lot of light on that. He's really good at pulling these kind of threads apart of things that we assume go together. For example, virtual reality spaces and gaming. Not always the same thing, of course. You can play games in virtual reality spaces. Uh, but it's easy to assume, as I do sometimes, that all of that is a kind of play. Also, the social media spaces that we're in. We also talk a lot about focus and the power of it. The power of focus for both good and bad, of course, depending on how you might want to use it. And we talk about this terrifying vulnerability of how entangled we all really are and the trust that is required not only to play games, but just to experience any form of art or connection to live, really. So love might be the opposite of games because it's non-disposable, as he says, it's non-fungible. Uh, but also you can love games and we should enjoy them as we're playing them. So enjoy this conversation and read T's work if you haven't already. It's interesting, timely. He's someone who loves art and film and writing and you get to experience that in his writing. I learned a lot here, uh, even about rock climbers and the percentage of mathematicians and uh, analytic philosophers that happen to do it. it makes a lot of sense, the logic of it, but I hadn't thought of it before. Anyway, okay, I hope you enjoy this. Here we go. Hi, T. Thank you for being on the show today. <laughs> it's great to be here. So... This is about love and philosophy, which can be a little daunting, those words together. But I want to start with language because you're a very good writer. And I've also heard you speak and you're a very good speaker. And I have a friend who used to say that you can't be a good speaker and a good writer. I don't know why he says that, but I'm just wondering, have you always been articulate? How did you tell me about your entry into the landscape of language? <laughs> I mean, philosophy was my second backup career. I was supposed to be a novelist. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> there we go. I, was... I thought you wrote about food, though. This is getting confusing. I... <laughs> that was also a side gig. I was supposed to be a novelist. I'm a failed novelist. Ah. I took tons of creative writing classes through college. I think my first professional journalism was like, I was like 15. And there was this contest in the local newspaper to be the teenage reviewer. And then oh. they gave it to two of us. And I think they were expecting us to be the excitable teenagers. But if you mm-hmm. get like an essay contest for 15 year olds, you're going to get the two most pretentious fucking <laughs> assholes who just want to talk about like Polish art movies uh, oh, and Robert yeah. Altman or shit like that. Oh, so yeah. yeah, so I was, I always thought I was a writer. I did fiction stuff. Weirdly, I kind of did philosophy as a backup career. Mm-hmm. I've always cared about writing. It's very hard for me to separate. For For a lot of philosophers, there's this, I think, academic tone that you Mm -hmm. learn and Mm -hmm. I I've always been kind of allergic to it I had to learn it to get through graduate school you you, you can do it when you have to do it but I I learned and got programmed to do this academic tone and I had to talk my way out of it but it was like finding my way back to like my actual writing style I was part of this literary magazine in undergrad years and it was anonymous submission where where were you by the way I was an immigrant scholarship kid at Harvard Playing okay. on the lit mag with all these fancy New York types. Wow. Um, okay. But you had to submit anonymously. And whenever I would submit something, people would find me afterwards like, that was yours. And I was like, uh, how did you know? And they're like, it sounds exactly like you. Uh, I could okay. tell from the first sentence that it sounds exactly like you. And I felt like yeah. grad school kind of beat that out of me. And then I had to like refine, refine through my own like nervousness and sorrow. Like, mm. Yeah. The natural voice I had when I was like 18. That's really interesting to me. It, it's not a dichotomy exactly, but there is this weird thing between serious writing and literary writing and, you know, blogish kind of writing, but right. all that's getting confused now too. So yeah. yeah. How do you think that serves a purpose in a way? It sounds like you're kind of resisting it, but yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, it's funny. I've just been reading about this. I think there's a history Mm. of professionalism where what it is to be a professional Mm. is to efface your personality and operate by the rules of your institution. So I've been reading this incredible book, uh, kind of a classic outside of philosophy uh, called from Mary Poovey called History of the Modern Fact. She's Mm. she's part of the science and technology studies world. Mm. And she thinks that the foundation of kind of the attitude of the sciences and modern professionalism starts with double entry bookkeeping in the 1600s and double entry bookkeeping she thinks is a is like the first major system in which you create you kind of architect a reliable system and if everyone follows it and enters information in the same way then it all becomes like interactive and portable and all interconnects really easily, but it only works if people are following these standardized rules. So, I mean, mm-hmm. philosophy used to be less like this. I think the sciences have moved. I mean, Poovey thinks that the sciences, starting with people like Bacon and Boyle, that the sciences were openly admiring of mm-hmm. the double entry bookkeeping and mm-hmm. openly thinking like, look, we are not rhetoricians or, you know, artist, what we're doing is we're trying to be kind of universal witnesses without particular standpoints or personalities who enter information in a way that has nothing to do with our individuality. Yeah, That's there's... really fascinating too, to think about bookkeeping and then computers, like the first, the real way that word yeah. is used and how that probably is a kind of a, not even parallel path, but entangled paths. Yeah. I mean, this is, so this shows up in, um, so there's this great moment in Theodore Porter's Trust in Numbers, a book I've been reading a lot and I just taught. And he distinguishes between a, two, a few different notions of objectivity. He thinks one of them is, he calls it professional objectivity, where you act out of your role mm-hmm. and not your individuality. Yeah. And there's a lot of reason for that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think about this a lot as a teacher. I used to be like scorn professional roles. And the more mm-hmm. I think about it, the more like I think when I'm a teacher, I should not I am, there are certain parts of my personality suppressed. There are certain students you naturally like mm-hmm. and certain students you naturally dislike as a person mm-hmm. and you have to get rid of all that shit, right? You mm-hmm. are interacting with them as a professional, right? Um, and 
But I also think so. You have to take on a kind of role. Teaching you have role. to take on a kind of role and remove certain parts of your personality. Mm -hmm. So he says there's professional objectivity. There's like objectivity as like removing bias, and there's just something he calls mechanical objectivity. And mechanical mm -hmm. objectivity is repeatable by anybody, right? Anyone can follow the rule system. Okay. Uh, so I, I think there's sorry. Sounds this, like a this, game this, a little bit. It, it, there's there's a lot of reason to think that a lot of what's going on is quite game-like. Anyway, so for your original question, I think there's a lot of institutional reasons, especially in the sciences, to create this kind of non-personal voice because we are trying to enter data by a particular system. And mm -hmm. there's this question about whether something like philosophy should be like that. Are mm -hmm. we kind of neutral scholars who are mm -hmm. entering standpoint free information and yeah. i don't i don't i don't that, that's not what philosophy has been for me it's been nope. people thinking and talking out of themselves yeah a lot of the philosophers that become sort of i don't know how to say it. i'm thinking of someone like nietzsche or something or even people who get called philosophers but no one who's or, or most people in academic philosophy wouldn't consider a philosopher or something it gets tricky doesn't it when you're studying philosophy academically Sometimes you can't even say you like those writers in a way, and you certainly can't really sound like them, at least not at a certain certain time point. But I wonder, was, what was it like when you were a student? And now that you're a teacher, do you get annoyed when you see that in your students ever? Um, I mean, it's really complicated. I, as a graduate student, had, I mean, in creative writing, I carefully learned to write in a way that sounded like me. This is hard. Like it's it's yeah. kind of it's it's a developed skill to have Definitely. like vocality. it's very hard to write in a way that seems very easy, which your your writing is yep. like that. It's very easy. It flows. People don't feel like they're working to read it. That's a hard thing to do. It's definitely a skill. Thank you. Uh by the way, I, <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you for noticing I work yeah. so fucking hard on this shit. Um like <laughs> I think there is an assumption among people that don't spend a lot of time writing that if it's easy to read it was easy to write the opposite usually like, no That's why I, I asked I, you about your language because you can speak well too and th those are also difficult skills but yeah you don't you don't usually learn one and then get the other for free yeah no they were both of them were kind of learned skills uh the writing i mean it's so much like i'll finish an argument and then i'll do about 20 or 30 more drafts to get oh wow the writing right and just play with sentences, change around ordering, shift examples, mm -hmm. and like through like <laughs> pain and suffering and polishing, like it eventually emerges into something kind of clean and simple. I, I remember a moment in writing my games book where I had I had this like 15 pages of very technical argument to prove a particular point. It, it had like quantifiers. I couldn't do it in any way mm -hmm. that didn't have like formal logic in it. Mm -hmm. And then I finally figured out how to do it in three sentences through a simple example and no <laughs> complex argument. And I was wow. so happy and it took like months to get that. And now mm -hmm. it just feels like nothing. Yeah, that's how it is. That's how it is. But do you think, I was going to ask you about this critical thinking thing too, because I think it can go the other way around too. I think you can have beautiful writing in academic philosophy. You are an example. It's hard though. So it can also also go the other way around where someone can sort of be articulate and, and write, but they don't do the critical thinking and the argumentation yeah. um, too. Because there is, there is something about forcing yourself to go into that logic. And that was hard for me, for example, especially if you're kind of more inclined towards the bigger picture, like learning those details. I think you also had a, an experience a little bit early on with logic or, or did you? I mean, I was always more on the romantic poetic side of the thing, and it took me a while to slow down and be careful. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I can say this. Um, I think people that concentrate on making their writing pleasing and don't have to worry about getting the arguments right have an advantage in popularity and in convincing people like mm. if, if you concentrate on nothing but charismatic rhetoric you're going to be a specialist in that especially if you're not loyal to like the difficult stuff so i think mm. for those of us who have 
some kind of loyalty to getting the ideas right and being careful and making it clear and presentable. Like, I don't know what to say. It's, it's hard as shit. It, it is really hard. And nobody so much work. But that no gets us notices. to the love. That gets us to the love a little bit. Yeah. That's a difficult word because why yeah. do you do it? You know, um, I don't know if, if you've ever thought of it in connection to that word. And of course, that word is overused. And also, we could talk about love of wisdom. It can go a lot of different ways. But just in this one sense, you know, it is really right. hard. It is really hard to learn arguments, to think critically. It's really hard in this little, small community of philosophers to get some respect because yeah. you have to know so much and you have to talk the language and then also to write well. So that's a lot of work. So what's motivating that? Uh idiosyncratic pleasure <laughs> like yeah, I, really? I mean i think good... one of the things that gets you into being a philosopher is you love a good distinction you gov love a good argument i can say i mean i don't know like i've taught kant's formula of humanity like for 20 years and when i'm rearing up to make the argument again i'm just like fucking <laughs> excited and like getting like loving a good distinction or a cool argument i think that's part of it and then there's just you know i think what makes you attracted to a medium a lot of it's about the kind of fussy shit you love like so i love music but i can never play music and i part of it i realize is i just have no affection for scales I like the hard grind of being a musician i don't enjoy mm -hmm. on the other hand there's a lot of the academic job that sucks and but for me if you give me a sentence and you're like fine tune the sentence just make it sing I'm just happy. Mm -hmm. I like doing it. Mm -hmm. I love change the comma, shift <laughs> this word slightly earlier. How does it feel? Like that just, and I, so I think for a mm -hmm. lot of us, um, one of the things we're drawn to is things where the basic mechanics of the medium are appealing to us. And we're, I mean, it's really important that people are different. By the way, it's funny. So, I, I just want to give a caution. Sometimes I talk about this stuff and people say that like, oh, T, you're trying to force everyone, even people who don't want to write to like, sp and I'm like, no, like mm -hmm. what, what, what we should have in our profession is a diversity of personalities. Some people have no interest in writing mm -hmm. and all their interest is in argument or scholarship. That's great. Um, but for those few of us in the profession who really like writing, like, it would be nice to encourage that instead of my experience, which was having it kind of roughly beaten out of me sternly. Yeah, people do, people are suspicious of it, I guess, yeah. in the in the field. But once you can do it, then you can communicate m much more widely with a lot of people, which you also eventually got to that point too, where it paid off or is paying off. This does this relate to the game? Do you write a lot about games and? I, I'm trying to figure out where the, is the philosophy that's that part of you that really likes to to solve the problem to get the sentence right. It, does that connect to this the interest in games? Do you see a connection there? Of course, it's you, so it's continuous. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. I, one thing I'll note uh, I've noticed is so I, I mean, but not all games, right? But for yeah. me, the <laughs> games I like are continuous with the other things I like, like. I mean, I try, for example, I tried running, running never did anything for me. Yeah. And it was when I found rock climbing and what rock climbing is, is precision puzzle solving it with your body, right? It's oh, like, yeah. that's a great way to say it. <laughs> it's like ecstatic physical problem solving. So like, uh, I've noticed pe people, sometimes I I've had people complain that, <laughs> rock climbing is like a fad among philosophers it's i don't it's is like it? this weird yeah, yeah mm -hmm. there are a lot of rock climber philosophers there's also a mm -hmm. lot of mathematician uh rock climbers um i think in the early someone did a survey of the first generation of rock climbers and they were overwhelmingly either gymnasts or mathematicians or both but yeah no there's something really but yeah. it, like what, i think the thing sense. that appeals to you about puzzle precision puzzle solving um is something that appeals to me across the games I play and the profession mm -hmm. I have. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a deep similarity, but often that similarity is like, I don't know, not where people think the core of the activity is, but. 
Mm -hmm. what I like. But it seems to be in the pattern or in yeah. the way of the progression or something. There's two things, right? I want to talk to you about specifications and this kind of thing of knowledge, because I think it disconnects, but also yeah. um, agency. So yeah. something like rock climbing, you consider a game. Yeah. Something like chess, you consider a game. Yeah. Yeah. And you say this is a form of art. Yes. Yep. Because it lets us experience different agency. Is that right? Let me be uh, fussy for a second. Yeah, please. So the definition of games I'm using in the book is Suits' definition of games. So Suits says that what it is to play... It. Yeah, what it is to play a game is to voluntarily take on unnecessary obstacles to create the possibility of the activity of struggling to overcome them, right? So for suits, inefficiencies, constraints, and obstacles are part of the key constituent of the game. Um, and it, it's kind of hidden in that little definition, but he makes clear in his fuller definition that part of how you create obstacles and struggles is by specifying goals, by, by specifying points. Right. Mm -hmm. So anything in which you specify the goal and then you specify constraints for the goal that are necessary to hit that goal, that's a game. And you do it in order to construct a particular kind of activity. By the way, I, I should just say, I don't think he, his version, his definition of a game quite captures our natural language of game, but that's the thing that I think it, it's a clear part of human life, these artificial goals and constraints. So the way, what I was trying to say is to use suits to ground an aesthetic theory of games, to say that suits is pointing to the center of games. So let's talk about the art form of that. Because there, there have been plenty of people, I think, who have been praising games and talking about them as incredibly valuable, important, but they tend to assimilate them to more familiar forms. They tend to say things like, oh, games are like movies, so they're really good when they have narrative and dialogue and script. They tend not to pay attention to like, I think a lot of what game players and game designers pay attention to, which is how these kind of mechanical features construct particular activities. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I say in the book is that if you take suits and you look at it, what you see is that what makes games distinctive as an art form is they manipulate our agency. Yeah. They manipulate what we can do, the obstacles we're against, and our goals. Like this was the key for me. Games set goals. They tell us what to want, and mm -hmm. then we can kind of just occupy it. What's distinctive mm -hmm. about games is that they work in the medium of agency. I, I just want to be really clear about this because... Uh, you said something a little different, which yeah. a lot of people tend to think I'm saying, which is the experience of games is always an experience of agency. And that's not the same thing. The medium, it being the medium, is not the same thing as it being the core focus. So for example, so like poetry, words are the medium of poetry. Is the experience of words, the aesthetic experience of poetry? Not always. Some poetry draws your attention to the poetry, but other poetry, like haiku, I think, so haiku classically draws your attention to the world, right? Like what haiku, a good haiku, um, so one of my favorite uh, haiku from Bashu, Bash, Bash, Basho is, even in Kyoto, when I hear the cuckoo's cry, I long for Kyoto. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of haiku pushes your attention towards thoughts about nostalgia, loss, movement, it points, it uses words to point to the world, where other poetry, especially a lot of modernist European poetry, draws your attention to the surface of the medium. Similarly, some film, I think, really draws your attention directly to its use of the medium. The cuts are really obvious. You think about the use of the medium. And other film is transparent, right? You like, the thing, the medium is skillfully used, and you just are lost in thinking about this character or the story. So games, I think, are really similar. Some games draw your attention to the agency, but other games, like like when I'm playing uh, Limit Poker, all of my attention is on other players' motivations and actions and their informational states. So it's not really drawing my attention to my agency. It's like using a gentle medium to push my attention somewhere else. The game matters. You talk about environment, you talk about constraints as the medium, and um, all of that makes sense. So it depends what game you're playing and it depends. Does it depend also the awareness or the intention which with which you're pay playing the game? I mean, you could yeah. play the game so as to X, you know, like increase. Yeah. yeah. So all yeah, of I mean, that. 
but this is totally this i think this is not distinctive of games so i think some movies mm -hmm. are really transparent to the characters i think of so i feel like you know if you're watching a tarantino film like that you're super drawn to the surfaces of the film it's editing choices it's so filmy right mm -hmm. when i watch something like i don't know an ozu movie like some kind of really character based thing my natural inclination is to pay attention to the characters and their inner lives. But I can also, if I'm thinking about it, kind of push my attention to how the cuts are working, but that's not where this film kind of naturally sends my attention, but I can take that attentive mode. Similarly, I feel like when I was studying to write, I would take writing, it was super transparent where the point was the writing was self-effacing and I could force myself to be like, no, I'm gonna study this as a writer. How are they making this so good? Similarly, I think there are a lot of games where the game just kind of disappears. But when we take them apart in my game design class, we send our attention to the rules, even if the rules are designed to disappear from your consciousness. So a lot of this is freeform. Uh, sorry, a lot of this is up to the player. But I think games are distinctive because there is more up to the player. Different players can play in such radically different ways. There's more space for agency and more space for freedom in the construction of the play experience. And that's one of the reasons I think traditional artistic theory has had a really difficult time coping with games because the particular, there's a lot of variation between different people's experience of a novel, but the basic sequence of events in a novel will be the same and the words will be the same, but there's so much variation Especially for, I mean, not just computer games, but if you think about something like tabletop role playing, different groups will have totally different stories, totally different personalities, totally different um, interactions. Although the game kind of colors and shapes them in a subtle way, pushes them towards a particular kind of experience. But the the path to the particular sequence of events in the play experience is so much more participatory that they're a really deeply different kind of object. Hmm. Did Suits think of games as an artwork at all? What do you think? Or, he I mean... didn't talk. He didn't talk about it explicitly. Okay. So um, I still wonder. I think games can be art. Um, um, can they also not be art? Are they always art? Oh, that's that's a great <laughs> question. Um, I mean, in the same sense that you were just describing. The yeah. Question. So, so let let me. Tr so here's something I didn't say in the book. I've been thinking about a lot. So in the book, what I mostly said was, you know. Art is basically a value term that's worth paying attention to. I think since then I figured something out. I think one of my favorite accounts of what art is comes from this debate uh, about uh, the difference between art and porn. Mm -hmm. um, and another subject you've written somewhat about. Yeah, it's it's super mm -hmm. it's super interesting. It's a super yeah. interesting debate. It uh, is, and, and to it, me, it gets back to this awareness intention thing too. But go ahead. Yeah, no this this is this is where it's going. So there's this great moment. Uh, the feminist philosopher of art, Anne Eaton, has this passage that totally like shifted how I think about these things, where she said, "Older definitions in feminism of what it is to be porn say porn is representations that are demeaning and objectifying to women," and Eaton's response was. Well, there's actually a lot of high art that's really demeaning and objectifying to women, but it's also rec recognizable as art, even though it's misogynistic. So that can't mm -hmm. be exactly the difference. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? A lot of people have taken a stab at it, but two, I really appreciate. There's one line of thinking that says something like, porn is part of an older category called sentimental art. And what sentimental art is something that like works on you mechanistically Understand rather than this. giving you freedom to experience it as to experience it in the way that you want, right? In this way, I think people in this way think that like porn is something like, you know, a Hallmark tearjerker, right? You just mm. it's want like one just reaction. Stimulating in yeah, certain ways. Stimulating. It's just stimulating a specific reaction. Yeah. Another way that some people put it um, is that Jerry Levinson puts it this way. Um, with porn, we don't care how it gets the, does the job. We just want the job done. With art, we care about the technique and how the medium was manipulated to get the effect. Hmm. And so if you buy this, then I think for every medium, you you not all film is art. Some film is art and some film is porn, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Some novels are art and some novels are 
porn slash sentimental slash whatever. Yeah. Same with games, I think, right? Like in either definition you take, some games are going to be open spots for us to take what we want from and other ones will kind of push us to mechanically i think actually the category of addictive game actually has this weird relationship to sentimentality and porn because it's just the someone mm. made a product for to jerk our chain in a particular way yes, but I yes think the and most... that, that connects to things you've written about gamification and yes twitter and uh, social media yeah. and that whole addiction stimulation this is really hard to talk about but i want to get into it a little bit because when you were talking about um film you, you obviously seem to know a lot about film i also love all those people you were talking about or we could talk about there's all these different styles but we're coming at it our we have a reference we've watched a lot of film we've yeah. thought about how they're different that's so our sensory experience of it is going to be different it has a lot to do with awareness and intention but also just every film we've seen up till this point right whereas yeah. someone else who maybe has never thought about film and they've watched films but never thought about film as an art form will watch a film and have a sensory experience that's different and both are legitimate but th there's some kind of difference there and i feel like doesn't that that happens with games too it, it can happen with social media there's some kind of weird way in which the more you're interacting with the thing as a medium knowing it's a medium it's changing or i don't know yeah i mean this is this is really hard to put the thing our finger on and there's yeah. been in the philosophy in various aesthetic theories there's been various rebellions against the elitism of the high arts i think people have lost what the thing you're talking about so I do think there's a deep difference between approaching something as an art or with an aesthetic attitude and not that's completely unrelated to its highness or lowness or pop culture-ness or not, right? I think mm -hmm. you can approach the fanciest film this way, but you can also approach like, you know, often culturally denigrated forms like comics and rap and games. Yeah, or even porn. Either... I mean, you know, we could right. think of porn as art if we really want to look at it in some weird way from some weird angle. Yes, so this is so one of the interesting things in philosophy of art is that there there are a set of theories that think what makes art different is the object itself and another set of theories that think what makes art different is actually the attitude we bring to it and you can flip back and forth stolnitz who is loosely kantian thinks something like when you come to practical objects you come to them with a narrow focus you're like here's what i want out of it and you only pay attention to the features in it that give you the thing you thought you wanted this sounds a lot like the sentimental art porn stuff right like mm -hmm. here's the reaction i want i'm gonna watch this movie it's gonna make me cry done mm -hmm. yeah. bargain it's seals for the release whatever yeah. yeah yes for the release of whatever exactly yes. <laughs> um every time i talk about this stuff especially at school i have to like you have to be careful remind myself not to get fired uh, <laughs> but i mean it's, it really is true we do use it, games and art as it, ways to release feelings or tensions or i mean we have to talk about all of that is it is messy isn't it it is it's super messy <laughs> um but so the in in this theory like what it is to approach something aesthetically when we can put it is you come to it open about what it could give you and how it could get there right and that that if if a stolnitian theory is right then the difference isn't necessarily in the work it's in the viewer, whether we come to it being like, okay, I just want this f feeling. If I get it, awesome. If I don't, it's bad. And a different attitude, a more open attitude that looks to the thing to see what the thing could give us, that's open to different experiences from the thing. Mm -hmm. And I think you can have you can have both those attitudes towards a game. You can you can see this in reviews. You can see people saying, like, look, what I want from a game is some Lose list of like or something. Yeah, or I wanna I wanna get caught in the addictive loop of crafting, and this game gives it to mm. me. It's great. If that game doesn't, not nah, right. That's mm -hmm. that's the sentimental porny attitude. Or you can have a different attitude. That's you know, I think if you combine the two things we said, that's open to what the thing can give you, and really interested in the the relationship between the details of the thing and the overall experience, mm -hmm. then you have a totally different attitude and relationship. Yeah, and it's similar to the one we were talking about with the writing and 
the way you craft it and then you get into a kind of a flow and there's this very strange thing about thinking about what you're doing and how that changes what you're doing but just to stay with games I was just thinking last night my husband really loves uh, sports and we live in the Netherlands he's European so it's mostly football right and American football was on yesterday and I am from the states and I remember these games um, college football where people just go completely mad like completely lose themselves yeah. in this group we were seeing it on tv and I was thinking could I do that anymore yeah. I think there was a time when I could just go to a football match maybe when I was 17 and just be in that weird spirit and now yeah. I think I would be way too aware of myself in this strange <laughs> atmosphere and all these people well I mean do you is it you can't do that or that your circumstances have changed I mean for me, I've never been able to get to that state yeah. in a football stadium, but at the right dance environment, I can mm. be, it's it's different. It's not, but I can mm. be lost in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually a good point because I ne football was never really the thing. I do think there's a way you can come back to it and be free in that sense and know you're free and it's even more enjoyable. Yeah. Dance is a good yeah. a good example of that. And I do think that's very, very wonderful, right? And that actually is, has to do with that uh, writing too, when you yeah. have learned the craft and you and then you come back to it and then yeah. something very exciting happens, you're in that flow. But it becomes uh, hard to think about in terms of agency, I think, because this is such a big word and an agent yeah. isn't agency, right? Do those, those seem to get confused sometimes? Like when we think about games, because in your work, yeah. you show that this is, it has a very big resonance in uh, society and yeah. the way we interact. Your very premise in your book about like the games, the person who's making the game is setting your agency for you in a way. I, I know I'm not yeah. saying it right. You can correct me, but this has very high stakes, doesn't it? Um, yeah. This high stakes in both directions. <laughs> I mean, setting, setting an agency is, that's the right way to put it. Like I think a game designer specifies your desires in the game. And you just take it on. This is, for me, as a game player, this just makes sense, right? I mean, I play a lot of board games with my spouse, and we open the rules. And then the rules just tell us whether we're cooperating or competing. And we just like, mm -hmm. it's funny that you walk in, you open the game, and sometimes like you can not know whether you're going to be trying to kill each other or outcompete each other or cooperating to stop. Like, And the game yeah. just tells you, and then you want that, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this found fluidity and i do think they get shaped right you like some mm -hmm. games you get plunged into a competitive agency some games you get plunged into a cooperative agency some games you get plunged into an agency where you're hyper calculating little statistics about like resource efficiency other games you get plunged into an agency where you're like trying to tell jokes as quickly as possible right the, these are different goals and different actions you can take towards those goals that's done that's mm -hmm all that the claim is now i think it's i mean there's a question about whether this is dangerous or not i think there's some people that think it's always dangerous right agency shaping is always dangerous mm. i think other people think Pasha, how could you possibly <laughs> worry about this but i think one way to put it is that if we understand any medium artistic medium we can see that it's incredibly powerful I mean, it's not yes. weird to think that narratives are emotionally potent and that's how they can be used for good or ill, right? Mm -hmm. That a narrative can let you explore different emotional experiences, but it can also be used for like fascist propaganda. Right? That's, yeah. that's not surprising at all. And all I think I'm saying is, look, what makes games powerful is that they manipulate agency. You can use it for good or ill. What it's like to use it for ill is to use it to trap people in a pre-specified agency with no autonomy or freedom. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. relates to that, what we were saying, if you don't know your environment and constraints are being set, that you're, that yeah. the game is being set for you, that's very different stakes yeah. of agency. And yeah. when you start, because you have written about something like Twitter, and we, we do all live in a more gamified yeah. world now, and you've written about that, but when you're writing a book or a novel, isn't that also giving you a chance to sort of be within the constraints and environment of a different agency. I feel like all of our endeavors in a way, when it comes to creativity at their best, we're sort of trying to share our perspective from this space time trajectory that we can't get out of. That's always a little yeah. different than everyone else. And at its best, whether it's film or movies or books, we get 
what you might call a pipeline. I yeah, think... you have this beautiful thing where you say it's like opening pipelines between two cognitive perspectives. There's this trust, mm -hmm. right, that happens and, and you connect in that. And that's what you're enjoying in the movie, in the book, in the game. But I, I don't know, how are games different than these other forms of art? I mean, there are so many forms of human expression where you're trying to communicate one perspective through some fixed medium. And yeah, but they're, what the medium is, is different. I mean, of course, every artist has agency and makes decisions. The difference with games is that's what the medium is. That's what's being transmitted, right? Like with words, with a novel, what you're shaping is a sequence of words that shapes a sequence of, sequence of events that shapes an emotional perspective that someone can step into maybe it'll i mean i just think yeah. the saying that they're the art form of agency is just shorthand for saying the thing i said before which i think is distinctive about games they give you desires and they give you abilities and then they tell you to do something that's different that's what they that's what that's the key of the theory like the the saying that the art of agency is just a shorthand handle for that that's what makes games distinctive mm -hmm. that's wonderful i just i want to push a little more because as we were saying, it depends what kind of game and the stakes depend on the game and all of this. So a board game or something, it's very clear to me, you know, what you say, that yeah. that's how it's designed. But if it becomes something like augmented reality or virtual right. reality, where you can forget you're in there, or even a space like social media, where we might be kind of living in these game spaces or mental spaces or a different kind of space than we normally think of as like, you know, physical, um, I, I want to ask these bigger questions about are, are we trying to start to, can we start to understand this in a way that might be um, beneficial? I know this gets really tricky philosophically and everything, but is there something about games that can help us uh, better understand each other? Or is it just, should we just think of it as an activity that's not necessarily going to kind of change who you are deep in your soul, the I way mean... a book might or art or... Let me let me start with a quick caveat. I don't think all VR environments are games. This is why I think the suit's definition is a little yes. different from mm -hmm. a lot of the colloquial use. So first, a, first, there has to be a specified goal. Otherwise, it doesn't count as a game. I think there are a lot of objects we have that colloquially call video games that aren't quite that. Like, so old school Minecraft, mm. right? It's a... I think of that as a virtual environment and a virtual sandbox that doesn't have a specific game attached. People can make it into a game. You can use, you can decide your own game. But I mean, my kid plays it. And some days he wants to do a survival game with zombies, and other days he wants to build the biggest tower. And what he's doing is using a virtual environment with a preset toolbox to come up with different games. And mm -hmm. I think like something like World of Warcraft is going to be really complicated because I do think people, it's a virtual environment that has a few pre-established games, but people will shift between them, right? What, you, mm -hmm. There's a max out points game, but there's also a, you know, a virtual reality role-playing experience that can be very non-game-like. And one of the things about virtual reality is, I mean, it's funny because I, I, sometimes I get request from journalists to talk about virtual reality and I'm like I know nothing about virtual reality mm -hmm. and <laughs> like what it is to be a virtual reality is very very distinct from what it is to be mm -hmm. a game so first caveat yeah, it's a good lot you say of the that. things to, that are going on in virtual reality aren't suits in games and so they're not they're different objects um you can play games in them it so, feels like play I think is the problem yeah, fantasy, there, but the, play, you know, this is where it gets very play is, are easy. It's easy to blur. Play is a different concept from games. Suits was really clear on this. He has this great essay where he says that he says play and games overlap sometimes, but not always. So he had this funky definition of play that I'm not sure I believe in. Uh, he said that what play was, was wasting normally instrumental resources for autotelic reasons. That is taking things that were normally useful and then just doing it for the pure pleasure of it, like mm. playing with your food, playing around. And he, mm. he had these examples. He was like, look, a lot of games mm. we enter into or playing pretend, there's not the game-like structure, but it is play. And he said also, look, if you are a professional boxer who hates it, but you're making money for it and you need to support your family, that's work, not play, mm -hmm. but it is a game. So I think a lot of VR spaces are playful, 
Mm -hmm. But I mean, maybe here, here's, here's something useful. A lot of, some people in the space distinguishing toys and games. And the difference is that games have a goal and toys don't, they're more free form, but they're both forms of play. Yeah. This gets really confusing because, you know, you have the verb, you have the noun, Yeah. but sometimes a game is a verb. Is it, is it that, um, there's something about the game itself that's more like more easily manipulated, uh, or more obviously manipulated or something? Yeah, I mean, first, I, I, I want to have like one caution. When a lot of people, when people think about games, they tend to be looking for one value or one function they have. And I just mm -hmm. think this is, this is why I like medium analyses. It's like, no one thinks that novels can only do one thing. Right. Like a novel is something that uses words and events. And then you can do a billion different things with novels. A game's, use agency and you can do a billion things with them you can use games to get healthy you can use games for brain training you can use games for free productivity you can use games to relax right there's a billion different things right so do. they don't always have to have a goal then no so they have a goal but i mean what's really important is that for a game a sutian game there's a difference between the goal and the purpose so the goal the goal is what you pursue in the game and the purpose is why you do it so <laughs> For example, classic example, party games. The goal is to win. The purpose is to have fun. And we can tell because if we lost, we don't think our evening is wasted, right? If you lost and had fun, you're just as happy. If you're you know, not a terrible person with a party game, if you had a great time with your friends and you lost, <laughs> you think that it was time well spent. Mm -hmm. So what I'm talking about is games fulfill totally different purposes. And in fact, the same game I mean, think about running a marathon, right? There's one goal that everyone shares to cross that finish line quickly. What are the purposes? Some people do it uh, to get healthier. Some people do it because they want to be the best. Some people do it for money. Some people do it because it's going to make them like uh, zen out and gives them this pure experience of calm and relax, right? So there's so many different purposes that different people can bring to the same game and pursuit of a goal by a particular constraint is often really flexible about what you can get out of it. Like I rock climb because it shuts up the voices in my head. That's the main, it's aesthetically <laughs> beautiful and it makes me stop thinking for a bit. Like it's, I, I can't stop thinking unless I have something that intense. And that's mm. the main reason. Does that's not the reason everyone too? does it. Uh, no, writing is giving in to the voices in my head. Oh, uh, okay. Does game writing, games? Um, totally depends on the game. I think one of the reasons I, I feel like I spend most of my life hyperverbal and uh, games like tabletop role playing are extensions of that, which are super fun for me, but don't refresh that part of me where rock climbing and I've been fly fishing a lot lately. These are totally nonverbal, totally physical, wordless experiences. And I find them incredibly good for departures from is that close to I mean, what you've talked about as a transition zone or something like that? I mean, do I mean you they're, they're, are they, they're, are you, what, what's happening in that moment? Are you just, are you not at rest necessarily, or are you just? Yeah, they're, it's really funky. Like, I mean, maybe some people can just rest. I don't rest. No. I can't rest. But it's weird. It's well, like you were so active that it's restful, or I don't know. Yeah. Rest isn't the right word, but. But I mean, it's related to what games are. Games are often artificial hyper-focuses on one part of your agency. And I feel mm. like. What it can do is, so fly fishing is very much about visual attention to the water. Mm. It's a very, like, I think, and I do my best when all the words are gone. Rock climbing is about intense attention to your balance and body posture. And again, words get in the way, right? So I feel like it often, it helps you achieve, it helps you rest. Maybe some people can just rest, but it, for me, resting the verbal part of my brain it really helps to have a hyper focus on a fully nonverbal activity this is why i find like i also tie flies i was talking with some people about how it's so similar in pleasure to crocheting and i think like part of the sim similarity is i i'm absorbed in the act of precise physical detailed movement with my hands and this like it's all feel and it's all like tension and movement and flow mm -hmm. and 
there are no words words mostly get in the way so like mm -hmm. I, feel, I mean one way to put it is i've always thought that games plunge you into one aspect of your agency and give you this totalizing experience and that often has to, and that often is an opportunity to or encourages you to shut off other parts of your agency which is really date i mean i think when you export this the dangerous version of this is make as much money as you can and don't worry about anything else yeah. but it deployed as a temporary measure i think it's great that i have something that i can reliably do that lets me not use words for hours at a time mm -hmm. it reminds me of walking that's what i do i find mm. there, there's something about too what you're describing in walking and that, that there's something about the co continuity of it and that you're not doing the same exact thing over and over but there's a pattern no. a recognizable pattern that yeah. does kind of it doesn't lull you necessarily but yeah and i think that actually speaks also and if we go to the dangerous side of something like Twitter or something like this kind of addiction that can come when real life is gamified too, because there's also something about that that can, like, you feel like you don't have to think or listen to the the words. Yes. And, you know, and that can be peaceful too. And in a similar way. Right. To the um, rock climbing. So maybe one way to put it, is that games are focusing and focus is most powerful and dangerous. What it is to focus is to pay attention to certain things and ignore other things. Mm -hmm. A useful way to play games is to play a lot of different games. And what that is, it's focusing on different things serially. That's great, right? That means you, so I think I never really saw rocks deeply until I started rock climbing. Isn't I never saw- You see the, yeah. you see it so differently. Like you, really do you, differently. Do you climb? Uh, I'm not a climber. It's more um, I'm walking and this, a similar thing happens, right? When you're really yeah. looking at the environment, everything comes alive in a different way. The textures, you start to yep. realize things aren't solid. It's very weird in a way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no. So, I mean, having games heightening your attention and focus to a series of different things over your lifetime, I think that's a broadening experience. Spending your entire life on Twitter and focused only on the things that will get you more likes or retweets is I think narrowing if you don't step back from it. I mean, it's focus is powerful and both abusable and usable like, mm -hmm. and games are tools for a kind of focus. Right. And this is an important point because that is a huge leap, right? Be being taken by something, having your attention taken or participating in a game, not knowing you're participating in a game. There's a big leap between that and what we're just, what we're talking about now. And like, um, how do we open that space? This relates also to knowledge, right? Is there any connection there between yeah. pursuit of knowledge or sharing knowledge or, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, so this is what makes games potent and dangerous. Like, with a game, you're stepping into a different sculpted agent. And it's, I mean, and one of the things is, if the good part is that it might teach you something you don't already know, that's also the danger. Because, like, playing a game is a jump into the unknown. But that's the same with, like, other arts, right? Like, mm -hmm. having an aesthetic experience. You can't experience go back. Is, you can't, un you can't go back. unplay, unsee, unhear. And, like, sometimes... You don't know what's there. You open yourself up to it. You're letting yourself enter an emotional perspective. Sometimes you learn something and sometimes you watch a fucking Darren Aronofsky film and you have like, like, you know, foulness trapped in your brain forever that you can never get rid of. Um, sorry. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. There's some things right. that are, I mean, violent is the right word. I think where it, you don't know you're about to be changed, but you can't go back yeah. once it changes you. And it is yep. art, you know? Yeah. And, but that's also like, that's what makes it powerful, right? The right, whole point you might that's why people gravitate something. toward it even right I mean, I don't like fluidity can be good and bad. Having new when art in general welds new parts of souls to you. like hope hope you don't get something shitty, but also it's hard to know what's like, you know, I mean, sometimes we know ahead of time. Um, yeah, like there are clues. I guess what I'm trying yeah. to push a little bit is that. Um, we are designing games for each other in a way. Do you, do you think games are only um, 
with the rules laid out so that you can read them in the way that you woke and then you leave it behind. Have things blurred a little bit now where we're creating games, playing games, sometimes learning that life is a game and, a, you know, yeah. and not not able to get our awareness and attention out of that long enough to change it. Yeah, I mean, okay. One thing I should be clear about, the idea that you can open up a game and put enter into the end for a while and step back from it, that's not guaranteed. That is a learned mm. skill yeah. <laughs> that people may or may not have. But also, like, I mean, it's also a skill that we learn and teach people to open up a novel, enter into another emotional perspective, and at the end, step back and be like, you know, it's, it's I think, valuable to read a book from the perspective of a mm. terrible person that was carefully constructed to be so and then be able to pull back from it afterwards. Mm. That's a skill we learn. It's a skill, but I don't, I, I mean, you can, you can probably disagree, but I don't think, I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we aren't changed by, mm. by all of that. I yeah. mean, I've read, you know, I've read a book once and I couldn't stop reading it, but it was awful. And I, I literally tore the entire thing up and like threw it in the trash after just to try to get rid Which of book? it. I, I've forgotten the name. It was literally, I was a teenager and it was about, I, I, let's not, let's not go there. Yeah. But I, it's still, I still feel it now. And it, you know, these things change you. And I, I have to say, I think the games we play change us too. Yeah. I've, whether they're basketball, volleyball, chess, um, uh, a board game, a video game, in my experience, they change the way I think a little bit. They change my sensory experience of the world after I've been playing games. I, I'm entering, I see the world differently. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think we're kidding ourselves to say that we can open anything up and put right. it away and not be changed. You no, know, I think it's just terrifying to realize that's that's true about everything. That's <laughs> yeah, true about is. people and novels and schools. It's true about everything. I mean, the disposable end thing in the games book is just about the victory condition. Like I try to yeah. win for these points. That's why I stop caring about. But there are all kinds of ways your thinking could be habituated by. At the, at the end of the books, one of the things I worry about is I think that there are a lot of people who have worried mostly incorrectly that games might habituate you to be violent because I think the empirical research shows that that doesn't happen mostly because we know mm -hmm. it's fiction. But I, I worry that playing games habituates people to expecting quantified value systems. Like that's a, but that's mm -hmm. not the specific goal of the game. That's something more general. Mm -hmm. Let me say, I, so the other thing I've written a lot about is trust. And I think yeah. um, trust is the essential mode of being for people in this world, right? Um, so a lot of philosophers, but we, so we were talking about Elijah Milgram on email, but Elijah Milgram changed a lot about how I think about epistemology and philosophy by really putting words to this like kind of inchoate thought that we are no longer in an era where we can have intellectual autonomy, that the key characteristic of our era is hyper-specialization. And that means to conduct ourselves, we're constantly having to trust trust beyond what we can manage. Sometimes I take my students in an epistemology class to an exercise. And the exercise is just, how many people have you trusted with your life in the last five minutes? At first, they're like, no one. And they're like, oh, wait, we're trusting this building not to fall down. How many? We're trusting the engineer. Well, yeah. Yeah. You're trusting the drivers on the street. You're trusting the brake mechanics. You're trusting the science that they use. Like how many statistics? So quickly what you see is that your trust runs completely out of your control, completely out of your sight. Your life depends on people you have no idea who they are. And I think the experience I have of this is vertigo, right? It's not quite terror. It's just like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. So Annette Beyer, who's my favorite one of my favorite philosophers ever. She has this paper, Trust and Antitrust, which I love. And what she says is the core of trust is vulnerability. What it is to trust is put something of yourself in somebody else's power. And that's what makes it valuable, right? That we are letting, otherwise we're limited to our own powers and our own management. Like, and this is, this is true with like kind of interpersonal trust, trusting my teachers with my kid's life. But it's also true with like, I'm on antibiotics right now. I have no idea what's in it. I, <laughs> right? I trusted somebody. Mm -hmm. um, Games seem like a way where you can learn how to trust. Look at that trust a little bit. Start to look at the patterns by which you've already, since birth, been trusting. <laughs> yes, there are so many games that are about trust. 
there are so many tropes about how team sports do this, but it is like one of the things you learn is how to work as a precise coordinated unit and just trust someone. Absolutely. That's also kind of dangerous in a way, but also it's something you can learn to do. But I, I, the thing I wanted to say is I think there's a deep trust involved in any ex artistic experience because you're opening your emotional self. You're opening yourself to transformation in ways that you can't expect. And I think without it, we don't grow. Right. But we also let shit into our heads. And this is the terrifying vulnerability again. I mean, I think what you said is true of games, but it's true of everything. Every friendship, every novel, every movie can change you irrevocably. And if you refuse them all, you'll be a static being who doesn't grow. And also, if you try it and you put your trust in a bad thing, it will shit in your brain. And there's no way around it because you can't know ahead of time what it is exactly. You can try. You can use guides. You carefully figure out who might be a good guide about what's going to be good and what's going to shit in your brain. But in the end, you're just opening yourself over and over again. Last question then. Um, is love ever a game? <laughs> If it is, it's a terrible one. Um, I mean, I think we have expressions like don't play games with my heart. And I think there, I mean, I, actually, I think I put it in the book. I almost cut it out. But there's a part where I say that what games are and what love is, is opposite. What games are is being able to be totally disattached to an end, be able to put it aside and put it away again and just use it instrumentally, right? Yeah, and that's what, what I was hoping is, you'd get to. Yeah, it's committed devotion or something like that. It's non-disposable. It's non-fungible. It's non-fluid. So I think... Yeah, it's really more like different. that trust state, but it's also, you can also start to realize it and still give way to it, I guess. Yeah. 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 But you can love a game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love rock climbing with all my heart. <laughs> yes, definitely. In many kinds of ways of love, of course. But thank you to you for talking and good luck with the rest of your day there. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Be well. <laughs>